Hello, I'm Jeannie Caldwell, and welcome to In His Presence. Today we're going to be talking about making your marriage work. If you know anybody that needs help in that area, call them and tell them to tune in, because I believe it's some things here that will help them. Because I want to uh, help you with the understanding, with wisdom, and knowledge in your marriage, uh, and your walk with God. But some of you have good marriages, but I think if when you start learning the truth of God's Word, you'll have even a better marriage. Now, the things I'll be sharing with you today uh, are things I didn't know when Happy and I got married. I really didn't. We got married in 1970. That's a long time ago. And um, I didn't know the first thing about being a helpmeet or a helpmate. I don't think I ever had heard the word before. And I grew up in church, but we didn't teach on those things, or they didn't teach on those things. And so I did not know um, what a help meet was. And uh, so I didn't have all the books that you have now. I mean, you can pick up a book anywhere. We even have a little bookstore in our church where people you know, can get a book on any kind of subject they want. And uh, so there are a lot of things that that we can learn as we go, but I didn't know these things. And so I had to learn the things I'm teaching you today. And of course, this is just on the surface. I mean, there's a lot, it goes a lot deeper. But I know someone gave me a book on marriage when uh, we started going to a Bible study after my husband got saved. And um, this girl gave me a book, and I started reading it, and I mean, I just got plumb mad, and I just threw that book, and I said, well, what's this all about submitting to Him and doing for Him? What about me? What about me? And you know, the more I read it, though, the more it was getting into me, and the more I saw the scriptures on it. But I think one of the biggest problems uh, in the marriage is the me problem, the big me, you know, that's, that's what got Satan thrown out of heaven. He was going to exalt his throne above the Most High. And so the big guy is better known as selfishness, pride. And, uh, and we're going to discuss briefly some of those things today to help you in your marriage because really God has it set up the way he wants it. And when you set it up that way, you'll find that your marriage will be happy. You'll have a happy marriage. You'll make your marriage work. I'm telling you, you will. But the first one let's cover is selfishness. Selfishness is a lack of maturity, and it really is. And uh, babies and small children are basically selfish. And, uh, but we look over it and say, well, they're just babies. They'll grow out of it. But you know what? Uh, when you, when you take a child to a grocery store and they yell and scream for what they can't have, uh, then they're revealing their selfishness or immaturity. If that child is not properly disciplined, he will go into a marriage so immature that he will want his way practically in every situation. That is disastrous in a marriage. And I don't care who is the selfish one. If you're selfish, then you are hindering the walk, the love walk in your marriage. You need to get rid of it, ask God to help you with it, confess it as sin, and then begin to change in the name of the Lord. They say that the adjustment stage in a marriage is the first three years. Uh, you have two independent people living, uh, learning to live together, and there's bound to be friction. However, marriage problems between ma mature adults can be worked out when they learn to adjust and understand one another. That's all it takes is just understanding. But if they are immature and selfish, there's going to be uh, those early years are going to be filled with noisy fights, adjustments, and a lot of conflict. And that's not good. It, it can cause un unhappiness in your home for both of you, really for both people in a marriage. Now, let me give you a checklist uh, if you're selfish or if you have an attitude of selfishness. Number one, a spirit of exaltation. You feel like you are better than your partner. A spirit 
of exaltation. Now, this is a checklist to see if you're selfish. A spirit of exaltation. You feel like you're better than your partner. Number two, you love the praise of other human beings and you want to be noticed. Now, all of us like to be praised, I guess, at some time or another, but when it's a problem with you that you've got to be praised, where you've got to uh, be noticed, it can be a problem in a marriage. It is a checklist on selfishness. Three, a centering of conversation around yourself and your interest. You got to watch it. A centering of the conversation around you and your interests. Four, spirit of impatience with others. If you're impatient with others, and I think we all have to work on that one. I know I do at times, you know, uh, if you're in a long line at, at a light, you know, or a red light in a car, and, and um, the first person doesn't turn or go when the light turns green. I mean, you know, you're looking around and you want to honk, but you don't, you know. But I'm telling you what, you have to pray for patience, or I do sometimes for that's concerned. And sometimes <laughs> it's been where I've been in that line, and by the time I get up there, the light goes red, and so I got to sit there for another well, however long it takes to come back around. So, but if you pray about being impatient, did you know God will help you with it? He will help you with being impatient. Retaliation when opposed or contradicted. Retaliation when you're opposed or contradicted. And uh, you have to watch that. Criticize when others have been successful. That's not good either. If you criticize uh, when others have been successful, that's not good. Rebuke with sarcasm, and that's not good either. That's a spirit of, that's a selfish spirit. It's an attitude of selfishness. Uh, jealousy, disposition, or envy. Now, that's eight things right there. It's a checklist, and if you uh, have any of those things working in your life, you need to, you need to admit it. Get them out of your life and absolutely begin to change your way of thinking and change your attitude. Now, to have the qualities of God in our marriage, we must be like Him. Remember that marriage is spiritual as well as physical, and you have to have the qualities of God in your marriage for it to be happy for your marriage to work. You must be like Him. Now, for selfishness, you get rid of self, you put others first. Selfish people are jealous and uh, full of pride, oversensitive, angry, harsh, resentful, and bitter. Whew, I bet that's a terrible person to be around, <laughs> and that's the signs in a selfish person or a selfish marriage when they only think of themselves. So you need to look at that. If you are jealous, full of pride, oversensitive, angry, harsh, resentful, or bitter, that's a sign that you're selfish. And you need to take each one of them and, and put the Word of God on it, I'm telling you. And when you do that, God will help you. When He sees that you're really, truly honest about not wanting to be selfish, wanting your marriage to work, wanting uh, your life with your partner to be a good one, a happy one, then um, begin to read the Word of God, especially uh, the, uh, uh, well, I can't find the scripture there. Well, let's see. Um, Galatians 5, and 23, which talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Get the fruit of the Spirit working in your life. You get that working in your life, and it will change you. I'm telling you, it will. So how do you overcome selfishness? Face up to it. Confess it as sin. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that when you become a Christian, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So the old things are passed away, and then all things become new. So for it to be new, that means that old man, that old nature of selfishness is a sin. Sin is a sin. And ask God to help you if you've been selfish uh, work at changing your attitude and uh, your behavior 
and apologize to your mate when you fail and when you don't do what you're supposed to do. Say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. And, uh, and he, if he forgives you or she forgives you, you'll find that it'll work. You'll have a peaceful night and a peaceful evening and a peaceful day. So the, maqui- the key to maturity will open the door to happiness in your marriage. Get mature where selfishness is concerned, and God will help you, I promise you. And number two is submission. Submission. I remember when I first started reading about that in that book, you know, I told you someone gave me a book, and I started reading it, and I just threw it across the room. I said, well, my goodness, what about me? (laughs) You know, am I supposed to do all the submitting here? Well, in this case... Sometimes you submit, but it does say uh, to submit one to the other. But yet, in the beginning, it says uh, you submit to them. You submit to your husbands. Now, we know that no organization can function properly with two heads. You got one head, and uh, this is true in the home also. Doesn't mean you both can't talk about things and discuss things and communicate. But uh, you have to let... I know my husband, you know, he makes the decisions, but I usually am in agreement with him. And if I'm not, we got problems. And he knows it. And so we're both mature enough in the Lord and mature enough in the Word that we make right decisions together. And I'm telling you what, it works. Now, modern women today don't think that uh, they have to or need to submit to their husbands. They really don't. So that's old-fashioned and... uh, uh, but, it, but that goes out of the home. When that goes out of the home, so does happiness. So you must keep it in the home. We have so many frustrated people uh, in a home, in a marriage. Usually a wife-dominated house is a quarrelsome house. <laughs> and her husband usually gives in, crawls into a shell of introversion, The children soon detect who's boss and will lose respect for their father. When a man is not the head of his home, he will not have a sense of responsibility and and feel he's married to a second mother. Whew, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want my husband to think he's married to his mother. And a lot of them do. They really do. The sad thing is a wife will eventually grow to despise the husband she dominates. Whether we like it or not, the Word says we are to be in subjection to our husbands. Sometimes between uh, 34 and 45, a woman usually reaches a period where she wants a husband to lean on. But if she has dominated him in their earlier years, uh, she'll find she has no one. And uh, she's trained him to be docile. And we could put it the other way around, too. I mean, you got to make sure that you submit to him, but he submits to you. And uh, submitting does not mean that you can't have a voice, though, in our opinion. Uh, you should. But when he reaches a decision, she must comply with it, whether she feels like it's right or wrong. Now, if it's sin, she does not submit to sin because she would get herself in trouble with God where that's concerned. But I know there's a time, and my husband tells about it when he preaches, about me saying we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't sign that contract. And I was standing my ground real firm, and he, but he had made up his mind, this is what we were going to do, and he hadn't been a Christian very long himself. And, um, but I just determined, you know, that he, he, he had read the contract, and he, want, he had signed it, and he wanted me to sign it. And I said, honey, I just can't do that. I don't think it's right. I think we'll be making a mistake. And so, but I finally did sign it because if I had never, I think I'd have been out on the street, <laughs> you know, we'd been divorced or whatever. No, we wouldn't have been divorced, but I tell you what, it caused problems. And he found out later, I knew exactly what I was talking about and he learned from it and he, he teaches the people in church, you listen to one another. Listen to your wife and she says, Let's don't do that. You need to pray about it. And so we do. We pray about everything now. Okay? And then the, the next thing is love. Love must be the basis of every marriage. And that's God's love. 
That's agape love. Love that loves no matter what. And you don't marry because you don't like it at home. I know so many people do that. And then they end up, you know, getting a divorce later because they just don't love them. But all their friends are getting married. So they feel like they should get married. Now, I tell you, I don't know so much now if that's the way it is. So many people now don't even get bothered to get married. And that's exactly what the scripture says, too. In the last days, you're going to find that. People just living together. And that's a sin. And God says it's a sin. So we need to get married, but we need to also marry because we love. You marry because you love that man or you love that woman. Just plain love makes a woman happy. Not jewelry or clothes or things like that, although, of course, we all need that. But I think we need love more than anything. A woman will go to any length for her husband if she loves him. And, uh, and that's true. Men, too, uh, they, need, they need love. And they need for you to let them know that they, they're loved. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 was what I was thinking about a while ago. That's the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Talks about the fruit of your recreated spirit. And uh, build those qualities in your life. And I know I've talked about this a lot, but I'm telling you what, you need to do it. You need to quit just having a hearer and not a doer of the Word. When you hear it, do it, and it'll begin to work in your life. I can assure you it will. Remember that God's love and His love is unconditional. And we must learn to love as God loves. And we can only do that if we have a relationship with him. If we don't, uh, we can't. We must have a love relationship with God. And he will help us. God, help me to love you. Help me to love you, God. And did you know he will? He will do that. I remember when I prayed that one time. Oh, this was early in our walk with the Lord. And I was in a Bible study. And I was learning for the first time some of the things I'm teaching you. And um, I had so many areas in my life that I needed to straighten out. And so I just started praying, God, help me to love you. If I would love you like you want me to love you, then we could do this. You know, I could do this. And I want you to know, after reading his word and spending time in prayer, he absolutely overwhelmed me with a love for him. And I said, I love you, God. And he said, I love you, Jeannie. And I said, I love you, God. And he said, I love you, Jeannie, three times. And I'm telling you what, he will help you if you truly mean it and if you mean business. Now, begin to bless your partner. Speak well of him and to him, not critical or insulting words. Keep your tongue, it said in Psalms 34, 13, keep your tongue from speaking evil. You, you can sometimes bless your partner by keeping silent. Keeping silent. I tell you, there's sometimes I hear people and I think, whew, I wish you could shut your mouth for a while. You know, they just talk, 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 chatter, chatter, talk, 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 and there's husband or their wife. Who's ever doing all the talking just sits there very calmly, very patiently while they, the, other, the partner just rolls on and on and on. That's one of the things that we could bless our partner by keeping silent. <laughs> Let your partner know that you appreciate them and are thankful for them. Let your husband know that, that you appreciate him and you're thankful for him. Cheer him up. Give him self-worth. Uh, respond to him. Think positive thoughts instead instead of negative thoughts about him. And, and uh, God has made marriage so that a husband is dependent on the appreciation his wife shows him for all he gives to her. And, uh, and respecting his manhood. They love that. And um, you can encourage by word, eye contact, touching. Those are some of the arenas of love. Touching is vital in a marriage. It demonstrates warmth, love, and affection. Hold hands often. Sit close. Hug one another. 
Try to go to bed when your partner does. And if you do not touch frequently and lovingly, the romantic love will be absent from your marriage. So you must learn to communicate with warmth. That's the language of love. Words, gifts, acts of service, which is sharing, quality time together and touching. You know, and sometimes we hear that and we think, oh, you're being silly. No, I'm not, I'm not being silly. I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. These are the things that the Word tells you to do. And when you do it, your partner is blessed and you're blessed. And so if you want a happy marriage, then start doing it. And I guarantee you, it may not happen overnight, but it will happen. I guarantee you, it will. The next one is uh, forgiveness, walking in forgiveness. An unforgiving spirit can rob you of all that makes life good if you got unforgiveness in there. It can keep you a prisoner. In some marriages, hostilities exist under the surface and they treat one another like bitter enemies. Usually they won't admit to bad feelings or problems. They just feel nothing but indifference to their partner. Indifference. Indifference is a result of buried anger that has led to depression, numbing of all emotions, both happy and unhappy emotions. A negative attitude produces energy that you have to deal with. When you conceal it, so much strength is required that you end up drained and very depressed. And I don't mean to sound so, you know, bah humbug, but I'm just saying we're talking about walking in forgiveness and what an unforgiving spirit can rob you of and it makes your life Everything that makes your life good, it will rob, rob from you. But if you want a happy marriage, you cannot afford resentment, self-pity, or anger. Those three things will literally strangle you, and uh, you won't be able to motivate like you should. You can forgive by one, not be controlled by your feelings. So many people are controlled by their feelings, especially women. We're very emotional where that's concerned. But don't be controlled by them. Be controlled by the Spirit of God, and He can really, really help you. And number two, don't be a prisoner of your past. Forgive what he did or said or what she did or said. Forgive them. And... Uh, you know, even worldly counselors are no longer giving attention to the person's feelings but concentrate on their behavior. Uh, not on their past, but on the present, the here and now. So begin to realize that you are in control of your behavior. Feelings change as your behavior changes. Now, begin to realize that you are in control of your behavior. Uh, so make choices to forgive. Walk in forgiveness in the name of the Lord. When the devil uh, brings up those thoughts to you of what he did or what she did, cast them down because all he's trying to do is get you upset, and get your feelings just all out of shape. And, but cast them down. Deal with your emotions, rebuke them, and, and rebuke the thoughts, and follow God's example, and that's forgive. You know, when they were crucifying him, he just said, I don't, he said, no, I don't, uh, uh, I don't, I forgive them because they don't know what they do. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, and they didn't know what they were doing. But he had the capacity to do that because he's love. So we need to, to do that too. Now, eight ways I would say to make your marriage work is be willing to change your ways and your habits. Marriage is an attitude and you can correct it. 
Be what Jesus wants you to be. Change on the inside. You can change on the outside too, but commune with your Heavenly Father and let Him tell you what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Be honest with yourself and with God. Two, uh, be a supportive role to one another. And you have to build that in you almost daily. Otherwise, you'll crumble when adversity comes. There are times you must be strong for your partner. And uh, even though you don't feel like it either, but you're strong for them. And you honor him or her through, and uh, God will bless you for it. He'll be the only one that maybe knows what you're doing. Make, uh, number three, make major decisions together, understanding that the decision will affect the whole family, and it will. Resentment and can build up in a partner if they feel left out of a, a decision-making uh, deal. But don't force your partner to make a decision either. Number four, get in agreement. Talk things out and be willing to listen to each other. Don't be closed-minded. Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Help. Don't criticize. Help. Get in agreement with your partner. A five, show appreciation. Learn to appreciate all your partner does for you. Don't take one another for granted. Compliment each other. God made man with an ego. Six, be friends. Learn to communicate. That's a must. Seven, don't complete, compete with one another. You need to complete one another. And then eight, in the sexual relationship, we uh, as wives have a God-given responsibility to fulfill our partner's needs and vice versa. Don't use sex as a weapon because that's cheap and degrading. So I tell you what, if you let God be God in your life and in your marriage, you're going to find out you're going to have a happy marriage. I can guarantee you. And you'll make your marriage work for the long haul. There's nothing like a happy marriage. And people know it when they see it. They really, really do. Well, I want you to always remember in His presence is fullness of joy. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today for In His Presence. You can write Jeannie Caldwell at Post Office Box 22007, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email her at JeannieCaldwell at VTNTV.com. To order a DVD of today's program, call 1-800-264-2525 and ask for the offer number on the screen. Join us next time as we meet in His presence.